talk and thank you for your patience with me. As uh, Kelly said, I'm Taryn Almendares. I'm a developer advocate at Pantheon. And this is my talk, Magic Comes From Pain, Four Ways That Embracing Grit Will Help You To Achieve The Impossible. Um, I am gonna start this out with talking about my story and why this is important to me and why I decided that I wanted to talk to y'all about this. Um, when I moved to Texas 14 years ago, it's because I wanted to be a game developer. And I wanted to be a game developer instead of a Japanese teacher and an English teacher overseas because I was convinced by numerous of my peers that I should embrace my talents and switch to the cooler major of being a game developer because um, I was naturally talented at drawing and I could do some programming. And so they reminded me of this and I said, okay, cool, I'll do that. So I tried that out for a couple years at Michigan State University and then I moved to Texas 14 years ago. Went to UT Arlington and I enrolled in their illustration courses but as soon as I hit the junior and senior level classes, my natural talent just started failing me over and over. And I felt pretty freaking useless. Um, I was explaining to a friend one day about a short story that I'd written. It was about a girl that decided that she wanted to give up on her dream to become a world-renowned magician um, because she realized that her talents and her passions were not enough to overcome her life's obstacles. And in explaining the short story to my friend, I realized that I was talking about myself in the story. Um, in that universe that I came up with, right? Um, the girl had like an inherent flaw because of magic and it's very Dungeons and Dragons-y and sci-fi and lizards and all kinds of weird things, right? Um, but for me, I couldn't understand what was wrong. Um, I followed the advice that's out there from everyone saying, oh, just follow your passions and everything will be okay. Um, I was talented, for crying out loud. I had been in gifted and talented classes since I was in the fifth grade. And I was in all these AP classes and I was gifted and I was smart and that's what everyone told me. Um, what I eventually figured out is that I had never had to face adversity in my life. Things just came to me easy. And so I never learned how to struggle with things. I never had to overcome things until much, much later um, in my life. But just like my character, thankfully, I had actually been developing a different set of skills. It was programming. And I just happened to, uh, uh, shortest version of the story is that I found out that Sailor Moon was from Japan because my parents had got the internet at home and I was like, mom and dad, I would like to make a website about Sailor Moon. And they're like, well, here's a book that can teach you how to do this. And so I would try to come up with, well, we didn't have divs back then. Um, I would try and come up with a layout and I have a little table and maybe we can look at it afterward. My first website is still up on Angel Fire. That's how long it's been. <laughs> um, but every time that I was trying to come up with some content um, and it didn't work, I was like, well, okay, let me try something else. Let me iterate on this. I didn't know the word iterate back then, right? But I just kept trying until I got it right because I cared about um, expressing this idea and talking to other people in the world about how cool I thought this was. Um, and I actually ended up picking up JavaScript programming. Um, a thing that I said that I might want to do a talk about is that I actually got even better at programming because I was spiteful. While I was at Michigan State University, there was a programmer that was on our team, and I was the artist on our team, right? And whenever we wanted to do something that the programmer did not want to do, he would be like, oh, I don't know how to code that. It's like, dude, you just made a fully fledged like AI. I'm pretty sure that you can make him walk up and down the stairs. He just didn't want to do the platforms. Um, but that gave me the drive to continue to learn how to do something, even though I failed, it was putting my um, control outwardly, right? It's like, okay, if I want to be better than what this person is saying that I can have, then I need to learn this skill. I have to learn this skill no matter how many times that I fail because I want to be in control of what it is that I do. So um, I was determined to never be in that situation again. And that is how I learned grit before I even knew the words for it. So want to talk to y'all about what grit is and why I think from the things that I've read and the studies that people have put out there that talent and passion can be dangerous for folks. So with grit, <coughs> excuse me, with grit, uh, Angela Duckworth, the author of the book Grit, defines it as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Um, what she says that grit is not is talent, luck, 
or an intense wanting of things in the moment. Talent can be taken as a distraction. Talent alone cannot withstand the test born upon it by adversity. Um, I am sure that some of y'all that are in this room have probably run into this. Can we get a like show of hands? Whoever has been like, oh, I'm very talented at this, and they run across the thing that is hard, and it's like, I thought I was supposed to be good at this, and I thought my talent was gonna save me. <laughs> Sorry, probably been plugging. Oh, I, I see more hands. It's like, oh, yes, yes, that part, yes. And, like, I think that one of the more difficult things, especially in the society that we set up for ourselves to do, is to admit that. Um, some of the language that we use when we're praising each other, or even though we're taught as children, right, is, oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're so good at this. Like, it's about, it centers the conversation on the person and not the work that they're doing. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But with talent, it's frequently uh, fueled by passion, it's leading, and it crumbles under adversity's weight. Um, there's a section in the book where uh, Duckworth discusses West Point. And for folks that might not be familiar, West Point is a military academy. Um, there are people that have spent the last two years getting really great at what they wanted to do in their studies so that they can get into West Point and then they have something called Hell Week. And it's about, well, Hell Season. It's about six to seven weeks. And suddenly these very bright stars that were very talented, like mostly they were on their talents with their hard work, they've been working all this time and suddenly they drop out. And it is because it is the first time that they've had to do hard things for a sustained period of time and most people aren't able to cut it. Uh, many rising stars drop out or lose interest before they even get to realize their potential. Uh, we all know that person that, you know, straight A's in high school and they get into college and within two years they drop out, right? Um, the other thing is that with talent, it's, it, it's not something that you can rely on for the long term. What actually does enable people to be able to excel when the conditions are hard, it's not passion and it's not talent, but it's skill. Um, deep skill can only be cultivated by embracing and cultivating your sense of grit, being able to stay in there and endure. Uh, we often understand failure as an end that, oh, we weren't good enough, oh, we weren't passionate enough, oh, we weren't talented enough, because that's a thing Talent and passion are both things that can be exhausted, is how we set our minds up. Um, but failure is actually just a stop of a process. And I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Um, one thing that I did not, that I disagreed with, I don't want to say don't like, about Duckworth's definition of grit is because she uses the word passion. Uh, I do feel like she was suggesting that passion what she was saying was about steadfast dedication to a goal. Um, since it's an intense and momentary desire for a thing, it's also not going to give you enough fuel to keep going. So for me, I would revise grit to being perseverance and determination. Uh, it's a passionate commitment to your long-term goals. And that's what I think a lot of folks, especially in the field that we're in as tech folks, uh, need to cultivate. I will have my small rant. I started Drupal's development on Drupal 7, and then Drupal 8 came out with Integrated Composer. And Integrated Composer is still the bane of my existence. It is difficult, I fail at it often, but I have to keep pushing myself to get better. Um, I think that one thing that happens with folks in development especially, and sometimes within tech, right, there's this irony that we tell people, oh, we recognize that programming is hard. We know that Drupal is hard, but also we need this next week because the deadline is next week. Um, we don't give them the time to be able to fail, uh, to receive feedback. I'm getting ahead of myself again, but it's because I feel so strongly about needing to support people while they're trying to persevere and while they are working on their sense of determination. So with skill, it is very difficult to cultivate um, they require deep skill. I think I've talked about this. Yes. Uh, when you are honing in on your skill and you're improving your ability, inevitably there are going to be times that you fail. Um, there's actually some neurology associated with this 
that we'll go into, but you have to, one, fail and be allowed to fail in order to improve your skills. Uh, there is a Japanese proverb that says, fall seven times, get up eight. And you can't get up the eighth time if you're not allowed to fall the other times. Um, yeah, I've talked about these here. I was gonna put up a picture of me from graduation. Um, this was because I started school in 2005. Uh, I dropped out, uh, had some family issues that happened, but eventually in 2014, my sister and I graduated on the same day. So people can make it, they just have to be given the room to do so. So the next topic that we'll talk about is about passion. I know that I've ranted about passion a bit, um, but there's also the passion hypothesis. This is gonna break down the whole follow your passions, follow your skills. Um, so there's an author whose books I adore, uh, Cal Newport. He has a book called So Good They Can't Ignore You. I don't know if anybody recognizes that. It's a quote from Steve Martin, uh, the comedian. But in his book, he dismantles the myth that people who are excellent at a thing do so because they are either exceptionally talented or ridiculously passionate. Um, he does that, the passion hypothesis. The problem with the passion hypothesis is that it keeps people perpetually confused and dissatisfied, especially when you're in the beginning stages of a job or you're learning something new, right? You're, you're seeking that dopamine hit from, I succeeded, this is great, I'm amazing. Um, the passion mindset is a mindset that, asks, that sets people up to ask, what value is what I'm doing giving me? What value does that assign to me? Would anybody like to take a guess at why this is dangerous? So what happens when we engage in this mindset is that you are setting up what you're doing to determine what your value is. So you start to think things like, well, I thought I was good at this. And probably one of the harder ones is, well, I thought I cared about this. You start having self-doubt and you start wondering, is this something that you've been cared about before? Am I faking it? And what does this sound like, folks? <laughs> imposter syndrome. I have a very strong sense of imposter syndrome. Um, I actually joked with Amy June before I came in the room. I said, so my imposter syndrome is telling me that I'm not qualified to come in here and talk to people about my imposter syndrome. <laughs> should probably work on that, right? It's rich, it's like, well, um, when you adhere to the passion hypothesis, it's assigning your value to yourself based on your work and like a temporary outcome. And so when you fail, which is inevitably going to happen, your failure invokes doubts that center on your personal character instead of letting you focus on the process of what you're doing. Um, you get constantly told, well, if you follow your passions, dedication and excellence are going to follow. That's not true. Most people that end up in jobs that they are good at or that they enjoy long term is because they tried out a bunch of different things. They found a thing that they were good at and that they wanted to continue at. And sometimes it's, a, it's about survival, right? I loved web development eventually, even though it was hard because it was like figuring out puzzles, but it also allowed me to eat and not ramen noodles. That was great. So I determined that I was gonna keep doing that. Um, when we however, get away from the passion mindset, because it's everywhere. How many folks have seen these books that are like, follow your dreams, not crapping on Dr. Seuss's books, well, the good ones, uh, but there's all oh, the places you'll go. And everybody just about gets given that book for graduation now, I see it all the time. And so part of that leans into like this positivity, um, passion hypothesis that, oh, if you just follow the dream, you're gonna achieve it. But when we break this down, it kind of leaves people feeling bereft. Like, what is it that I should look at next? How can I be present in the world? Uh, what Cal Newport suggests is something called the craftsman mindset. So instead, it asks, what value am I producing from the work that I do? So you'll see kind of like the shift that's there. It's not about you as a human, but about the work that you do. Um, you can always improve upon and change upon change the work that you're doing. Uh, some folks look at this as far as the 10,000 hour rule. Have you all heard about that? We'll talk about that in a bit, but it's focused on uh, continuing to put in the work 
rather than turning that lens in on yourself. So now that I've deconstructed a lot of very positive, happy, centric things that folks talk about, uh, defined grit, perseverance and determination, having people shift their mindsets, how are we going to, as I told you all we would talk about in this talk in my title, how are we going to use and embrace grit in our everyday work in order to get better? In other words, how do you transform the pain that is inevitably going to come from trying to do hard things, from trying to better yourself and your skills into magic? I have four pillars that I have personally and that I got from like synthesizing all these things. Um, embracing failure as part of the process, engaging in deliberate practice, cultivating your resilience, and cultivating cultures <laughs> where grit can thrive. So the first one is embracing failure as part of the process. I would like y'all to take a minute to think about a time when you were challenged, where you faced adversity, and when you overcame it. Specifically, I want you to think about how you felt afterward, and if you can recall something that you achieved after that failure and how you felt then. So anytime that you do something new, it's likely going to be outside of your comfort zone. That could be like installing a new module on your Drupal site, or even like going into a site building. We had a training yesterday, um, getting started with Drupal, and a lot of folks were building their first views for the first time and watching people do things that were uncomfortable for them, the first thing that I like to do in any kind of mentorship situation I'm in, any kind of teaching and facilitating situation, is to let people know, hey, ask questions. You will likely fail at this. There's nothing wrong with failing. Because that means that you have tried something and you know what does not work. So analyze that. Um, there is always a high chance that your first attempt at something you're going to fail, but knowing that, it's critical to embrace that feeling as part of the process and to separate it from your sense of self and your identity. Because even when you get better, your failure rate is going to drop, but then once you get to that point, your mid-level attempts will have imperfections. And perfection seeking is the absolute enemy of progress. If you're somebody like me that has ADHD, it is a complication of your neurology, and so you consistently seek out perfection. Um, it's something that a lot of uh, neuroatypical folks have to work even harder to conquer. Um, one good thing, though, about neurology is that there's a neurological case for embracing failure because experiencing adversity that you end up overcoming with your own power and skill, not somebody like, you know, a senior developer taking your code and be like, all right, well, I'm going to fix this for you because you're taking too long on it. When we do that, we're actually taking away people's ability to get better because you actually, let me, oh, I'm excited right now, sorry. So <laughs> um, the principle of experiencing and embracing adversity is rooted in neurological science. This is a picture of the limbic system. Um, you can only establish the skills to conquer adversity once your amygdala and your limbic system have been engaged in an experience of failure. Um, it's, it's just like when people do weightlifting, it's weightlifting in your brain, something has to break in order for you to build a new pathway. So in other words, you can only get good at succeeding at hard things because you've been exposed to failure or near failure states. That's why failure is not personal. It's important to recognize it's not a permanent state it's not a signifier of morals or personal worth or whether you're lazy. The only time that you fail permanently is when you decide that you're going to give up permanently. So, some ways to embrace failure because it is very easy for me to get up here, right, and say, oh, it's okay to fail. Failing sucks. It hurts mentally. When you fail at something, examine the failure through the lens of process. Why did you end up failing in that process and what did you learn from it? It starts to separate it away from you, and you can uh, uh, look through that. Sorry, you can look through that lens at it. Um, one thing that I find very helpful is identifying the times in your life that you failed, but it actually helped you to succeed at something else. 
I will not forget the first time that I forgot to pay my car insurance bill and I got pulled over for like just a regular traffic stop but it turned out that it was out by two days and for the next four years in Texas I had to pay a $200 traffic bill. I never forgot to get my insurance up to date again. Um, and finally, it's one thing to write it down, it's another to refer to your notes often and reflect on them because it's very easy, especially when you start to get into that groove of getting good, right? It's like, oh, you know, I think I'm a mid-level developer now, maybe senior, I don't know, I'm a developer advocate now, I forget, time changes. But um, it's very easy to forget all the things that you've had to overcome to get to the place that you are now. So when you refer to those things, you're reminding yourself in the now that this is normal, it's always been a part of things, and it's just part of the process. The next tenet from um, both grit and so good they can't ignore you is engaging in deliberate practice. Uh, we've learned how to embrace failure, so how do we get good at practicing failing? Deliberate practice is being effortful in nature. It is the practice of repeatedly working on a skill in order to improve at it. Uh, the main goal is personal improvement of performance, not about enjoyment. Uh, in Cal Newport's book, he mentions that when he was younger, he played guitar. And so he played guitar a lot, and he learned like some of his favorite songs, but he played the same songs over and over again until you know he mastered the song but there was a young man, I think he was like 16 or 17, his name was Jordan. And Jordan had been going on tour with all these different bands. And people were trying to understand how could this 16 year old kid get so good at what he did. And it's because Jordan would spend two or three hours just working on different scales. He would uh, take a very complicated lick that he was trying to work on. And intentionally, he, and when I say complicated, it's like super complicated. How many people in here have ever played an instrument before? Okay, cool, most folks. So, you know, 16th notes and things like that. So, so in music, when you're playing through uh, your scales and things, there are some licks that can go very fast. I played bassoon, this is why I was doing this, right? And then also clarinet. And you've gotta get the coordination in your fingers to go as fast as these shorter notes are supposed to be. So, in order to do that, you can't like push yourself to be able to go at speed at first. Jordan would intentionally just slow down work on his technique, and just hours and hours at a time he's going through. So what that deliberate practice allows us to do when we are giving ourselves the space to do so is that you can take the time to notice, oh, when I'm trying to, keeping on this music analogy, but also using a clarinet because I don't know how to play guitar, um, when I'm trying to move to these different sets of notes, I keep tripping my fingers, like my middle finger and my ring finger over each other. I need to learn a different technique for holding it at this point. Um, you don't get to observe those things unless you are intentionally cutting out space for yourself to be wrong and to observe your own behavior. Um, even with programming, there are times where uh, we've got the muscle memory to do to build out a view, right? And we know how to build a view. But when it comes to doing something more complex, if we're not giving ourselves the space to learn the new patterns, then it, you're gonna end up stumbling over yourself. Um, and I have in here, like, why did the last build fail? Not just like putting the blame, get blame on anyone, right? Um, a very important part of this process, if you have the space for it, can be coaches or mentors. Um, people, I feel like there are times where folks will have this generic, oh, well, you should find a mentor. The reason why coaches and mentorship are important is because you have someone that is going to be a guide for you. They know what you're trying to do, and they're able to be helpful because they can give you insight and suggestions on how to improve your form in ways that practice alone can't. Um, my personal example is when I was at Lullaby, um, first and foremost, because Dwayne's in the room, I learned how to use Git because Dwayne had this talk that he explained this is how Git works and this is how the command line works and Git, and Dwayne also explained to me that Git was not too resource intensive and that somebody was telling me things that were not true so that we didn't use Git, right? But then when I finally got to use Git, 
uh, my mentor at Lullabot, Kathy Thais, was showing me how to use the CLI and how to do Linux commands. And so there were shortcuts that I could have done. Um, and I had another person that was trying to mentor me at the same time that was just like, well, here's the thing that you do, just do it. And when I was working with Kathy, Kathy would have me like write out all the commands, just practice it over and over again because I was building up the muscle memory. With that intentional, deliberate practice and the extra time that she took and encouraged me to take, I learned the process, the why of it, the theory behind it, so that when things crashed later on, I would be able to go back and troubleshoot and say, oh, okay, well, I know that these couple steps are the things that I'm familiar with. This is the part that was unfamiliar, and you can start to fix, correct the behavior yourself. Um, I, and I, I, I put this anecdote because, one, I'm very grateful to Kathy for taking the time out. The extra time as a senior developer that's got a lot of stuff that she could be doing um, to help me learn that skill and to understand the theory behind the practices that I was learning because that's how my brain works well. Um, and what would happen the other way that I was being taught is that when I would mess up, I would freeze because I didn't know what it was that I had done or what I was supposed to do next or how to even try to address the problem. So that's like a programming version of a deliberate practice. So some ways that you can engage in deliberate practice. Uh, I've gone over this a bit, but intentionally setting aside time each week that's dedicated to doing something to grow your abilities. Um, just like uh, piano players, singers, anybody has to practice their scales and their techniques, you need to practice the fundamentals of building upon your fundamentals. Um, for programmers, this could be kokatas or practicing building out projects using different design patterns. Thank you to Jonathan for giving me a link that will be in the notes here. Um, for different uh, design patterns that you can do in PHP. Um, for graphic designers, because I said, you know, there's a lot of people, different people in the room. It can mean doing something like the 100 days of UI design. It's just going in and trying a different thing, trying different patterns. Project managers, for you, you could research and practice different communication styles or tools for when you're trying to problem solve with other humans. Um, my suggestion here is to have a friend role play with you to practice that conversation and let the friend know, like, it's okay to throw me some curveballs so that way I can practice, well, what do I do when this person says, well, I didn't know that this was supposed to be committed this day, so I'm not coming in. That happens. And for site builders, experimenting with uh, building different views with information that already exists on your site just to see what you can do. Um, try to emulate other things that folks have built. Uh, for the next one, getting funded through work. This could be getting funded in terms of your time or if your job has um, education budgets that are accessible to you, make sure to take advantage of that. Um, people say this, but especially with deliberate practice, I know that I get a little iffy about when we say, oh, well, if you're an open source, you just need to have a passion project on the side. But there's a lot of people that are in our communities that don't have the extra time on the side to be able to do that. They have families and kids and dogs and hobbies. You can also just have hobbies that you want to engage in, right? Um, and it's also, because it is important for your employer for you to be getting better and for you to improve your skill, it should be a prerequisite that's there. One that, way that I suggest tying deliberate practice to your work is if you are employed by someone, talk to your manager or your supervisor about ways that you can tie your top level goals. And top level goals are like, Essentially, it's like you have a goal, and once you get to the point where you're asking, well, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to do this? The top-level goal is, well, because I want to do it. Figure out how to tie your top-level goals to any kind of OKRs that you might have or other progress markers, because it, then it's in their best interest for you to do it. If you have a nice boss that just understands this, you don't have to do so much work, but yeah. Uh, tenant three is cultivating a sense of resilience. Uh, resilience is very important because feeling like you're not doing well feels bad, but you need to be able to keep pressing on even when things get hard. Uh, sometimes support networks are really good for that, right? If you've got a mentor from the last example, um, that will be helpful. But you also need to have an internal sense of resilience because 
sometimes at the end of the day, it's just you. This part I had a hard time with because I am a realist and people say that I might be a little bit of a pessimist, but Angela Duckworth suggests optimism, but she called it hope, so that's how I got tricked into it. But it did make sense. Um, in the book, optimism and hope are related to resilience because it's an acknowledgement and reminding yourself that the discomfort and pain that you're experiencing is temporary, it is solvable, and it has a way out. Uh, a lot of the examples in the book were very unfortunate because they discussed kind of like learned helplessness and experiments on animals, like being shocked, which, yeah, um, I didn't know like how to talk about that. But when a person is in a painful situation, they either can have an understanding that they can get out of it, or they just accept that this is how it's going to be forever. These are two different mindsets. They are fixed mindsets. This is commonly found in folks who have been faced with situations or challenges that they can't control. You say, well, this is just going to be this way forever, so I'm not going to try, and that's that. Um, this had to do with some, there were two sets of dogs. Some of the dogs were in a cage where if they moved off of a pad, then the shock would stop. And some of the other dogs were in one where no matter what they did, they would continuously be shocked. Humans are kind of barbarians sometimes. But the dogs that had been in a situation that they could get out of when they were learning other skills, they kept trying. But the dogs who were tormented by humans for scientific experiments just stopped trying, no matter what different things were. But with growth mindsets, these are common in folks like the first set of dogs that have been faced with situations, apologies for the typos, um, or situational stressors that they were able to control and escape from. Um, for example, I'll use myself and not talk about animals being shocked anymore. Um, when I ended up kind of failing out of college, which I don't talk about a lot, um, at first it was like, okay, well, guess I suck at school and I'll just work for a while because my family needs help anyway. But when I went into a major where, and when I went to a school system where I got the support and mentorship that I could fail at a thing but still continue to try to do things, um, I feel like that I switched over from a fixed mindset, I'm not good at drawing, to a growth mindset of, okay, well I started working on this program and it didn't work out, but I can still improve the skill. I also went back to drawing eventually, so I learned that I could uh, I could erase things. I know I could erase things, but that kind of thing. I stopped thinking about it as, this is not my talent. I can't do this. I can't get any better. Um, resilience is important because it helps you to engage in the practice without engaging in the mindset that failing is a result of personal flaws that you can't overcome. Resilience keeps you in the growth mindset and not the fixed mindset. So ways that you can cultivate your sense of resilience, admittedly, I feel like this is one of the hardest ones. Um, eliminating negative self-talk is really important. I know we've talked about this a bit, but have you all ever had a person, have you ever had a negative self-talk that you've had to yourself? And you've had a friend that's like, hey, don't talk about my friend like that. Be that friend to yourself. I've been working on it, and it actually does work, because I say that to myself. Um, Instead of saying, oh, well, I suck at this, it's, oh, well, I had a hard time with this because of X, and I can improve this skill by Y. And then also have some tangible reminders of times that you did succeed and overcome adversity. Um, when I built my first view in Drupal, I bought myself this pair of shoes. They're like furry little boots with like little heels on them, but I pushed through, and my senior developer, while he wasn't telling me that Git was resource intensive. Um, he said, you know, I was watching you the whole time, like in your development environment, and I didn't want to come and bother you. But I was like, okay, if she gets stuck, she'll come to me. And because I was allowed to get better at that on my own, man, I was building like all kinds of views after that. I built like this whole thing for like our retirement seminars and agendas. But it's because I knew from that experience that if I just kept trying at building the view that I wanted and kept experimenting, I could do it because I was allowed to have that failure. 
But then the last one, Tenet 4, Cultivating Cultures of Resilience. This has more to do with three different areas. I can talk about these um, with cultivating it at the individual level. So we talked about that a little bit as far as self-talk. Um, also, cultivating cultures of resilience for individuals. Um, sometimes having, I, I feel like I've talked about the support network. I really wanted to talk more about teams and jobs on these two items um, because who has been in a work environment where everybody is just talking down about, oh, so-and-so failed on this, so-and-so is not good at this, so-and-so is bad at this kind of work. How does that feel? And y'all can yell things out. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. Then you're like, oh well, if they're talking about so and so, what are they saying about me when I put up my PRs and stuff? Yeah, I've, I've been in those. Um, on the converse, what does it feel like when you're in a team where folks are encouraging each other, saying, "Hey, great job! You tried to do that. I think if you did X, then you could do this better." Or they they actually acknowledge your attempt. They suggest ways that you could improve, and they're supportive. How does that feel when you're on that kind of team? Much better. Um, I think that this is a really important skill as far as like cultivating cultures of resilience um, for managers, people managers. People managers are often the people that set the tone and the culture on their teams. I'm looking this way because my people manager is sitting over there and I'm not trying to like talk at you, John, because I think that you do a good job at it. But um, having a manager that encourages you to do more and also that, you know, goes over, that supports these other tenants that we talked about, giving space for deliberate practice, um, cultivating the growth mindset. Sorry, I'm a little tired at this point and I should probably have brought my water bottle. Um, that can make all the difference to the productivity of your teams. And then jobs being the last area, it's one, uh, there are examples all over tech, right, where a company can be seen as relatively atrocious without naming any companies directly, right? Um, but <laughs> everyone is laughing because everyone's like, oh, I know that one that you're talking about. And it's like, no, it's probably one of several, but we all know one, right? Um, but then you hear that there are pockets in the company where there's a good team with a good culture that's supportive, where people are encouraged to work and experiment and get things wrong. Uh, that can make all the difference. The a really cool example that was in the book um, was Enron. Because I think Enron happened when I was much younger and I didn't understand what had happened. Um, at Enron, they had a culture where it was like very talent focused, very like achievement oriented and people were not allowed to be wrong. So what would happen is that no matter how much money or how much success you brought to the company, if you ended up in the bottom 15% of people, guess what happened? You got cut. And so, guess what people started doing so that they didn't end up in the bottom 15%? Super shady shit. <laughs> and so it created this culture where nobody wanted to be at the bottom of the pile and everybody was doing things that were not above board and Enron collapsed and took a lot of people and things down with it. So. That is why I think it is important for jobs, organizations, to also cultivate cultures of resilience. Because one, you don't have a collapse of your organization, and two, it just makes your uh, workers a lot more productive. So, that is actually the end of the talk. It's the first time I've given it. So thank you so much for coming.